All right, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, Jennifer, if you hit the next slide, make sure everybody's in the right place. Uh, this is the 2022 Energy Code Multifamily. Uh, this is a special course for our Central Coast and Ventura ICC chapters. Uh, and this is put on through 3C Ren in partnership with Jennifer Rennick and Grant Murphy of Inbalance Green Consulting. Next slide. So quickly, if you have a question, please feel free to put it in the chat and we will have um, some of our experts here either respond to you in the chat or flag some of your questions to be addressed. Uh, there will also be time, hopefully at the end for questions if you want to come off um, mute. Um, and then if you are having any problems, please feel free to message me directly. I am going to be monitoring as well as the host for today. Next slide. Briefly about 3C REN or Tri-County Regional Energy Network. We are a partnership between three counties and we take ratepayer funding and put it back into energy efficiency programming in our region for building professionals and households. Next slide. We have three main programs through 3C REN. The course that you are here at today is through our Energy Code Connect program which serves all building professionals and includes services in addition to training and support, a live energy code coach, as well as regional forums, which we'll talk about at the end of our presentation today. Our other two programs are building performance training for building professionals and our home energy savings program, which offers rebates <clears throat> for multifamily and single family. Uh, and then the last slide for me, uh, I think is just another note that I am the 3CRN staff online. Uh, you can see by this background and I will do my best to stay um, monitoring and accessible to you all. So with that, I'm happy to hand it over to Jennifer and Grant. Hey everyone, welcome. Um, this is um, a part of a series that we're doing. We're on the third one. Uh, we did previously one kind of introduction to the code and, uh, you know, uh, single family changes. And now we're going to focus on multifamily changes to the 2022 code today. Um, Grant is here with me. He is uh, also certified energy analyst. I am also, um, he is here and he'll chime in as needed and he's going to monitor the chat and he could field any questions and it's okay to uh, ask questions while we're going along. And if it's something related to the slide, Grant can stop me or if there's something I missed, he'll, he'll uh, pop in, but I'll mainly drive the ship on this one. Today's learning objectives are here for the AIA credits, if you were getting it, or, um, or your learning units for ICC. And for our agenda, we're going to briefly uh, touch on how the energy code has been reorganized from the previous code cycles. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the high level changes in the, and especially the mandatory measures, code changes from 2019 to the 2022 code. We'll touch on some of the performance, mostly prescriptive code changes that are part of those um, kind of major uh, updates. And we'll hit a little bit on some of the additions and alterations that pertain to some of those major highlights. So really big picture though, before we talk about how the energy code has been reorganized, I wanted to mention that for the 2022 code updates, the California Energy Commission has kind of reworked this code cycle to encourage heat pump technology for both space and water heating They've established electric ready requirements for single family and multi family projects, which we will definitely be talking about. And they've expanded the PV systems and battery storage requirements, which we will definitely be mentioning and strengthening our ventilation standards. And by ventilation, I mean indoor air quality, like fresh outside air standards. 
the old code 2019 was kind of basically organized so that there were sections that dealt with all buildings and there was a section for high rise residential non-residential hotel motel and then there was low rise residential sections so under the new 2022 code we still have these all buildings sections and now our non-residential and hotel motel sections have had the high rise residential portion pulled out. And then under the low rise residential section, it's now just single family residential, which includes like uh, duplexes and townhouses when they're part of um, you know single family projects. And what's new is that there's sections specifically for the multifamily buildings. So that includes those low rise multifamily and the high rise multifamily that were pulled out of those other sections. So another way of looking at it, if you're visually oriented is kind of this um, structural tree is we basically had everything in the code that was low rise residential kind of in sub chapter seven, eight, nine, and then everything that wasn't low rise residential got lumped all together in chapters uh, three, four, five, and six. And so that's why it included a variety of occupancy types, including high rise residential, hotel, motel, and covered processes, and a lot of other non-residential occupancies. And then under that new code, we now have not residential, projects. We've got the single family residential, and then we've got multifamily residential, which includes low rise and high rise residential. And this is what we're going to focus on today. There are these uh, mostly focusing on these chapters of the code 10, 11, and 12. So specific to multi family, some of the high level changes is that there is a, a new metric for compliance under the performance method. And that additional metric is called source energy. We'll talk about it in a moment. And the heat pumps for space conditioning are part of the new baseline. So that changes the performance a little bit. We won't go into much detail on that. It's just, um, it's important to note. And then there's some major updates to the dwelling unit indoor air quality ventilation, which we'll hit on. There's electric ready requirements. So when gas appliances are installed, they have to be ready to easily swap out for electric appliances. We'll talk about that. There's some vo photovoltaic and battery requirements that are specific to multifamily. We're gonna talk about that. And then there's been some minor updates to the envelope, lighting, uh, kind of domestic hot water. And some of those more minor updates really have to be how it's organized under the code and not so much the changes from 2019, but we'll, we'll touch on a few of those. Kind of big takeaway with the multifamily in addition to being, uh, in addition to including high rise and low rise multifamily, it's um, under that performance method, which will actually in the next slide, or next slide, we'll be talking about what I mean by performance method in case you're new to the code. But under that way of using computer modeling um, and prescriptively, we now have heat pumps as the baseline for the dwelling units for their heating and cooling. So as we go through this, there's basically three terms you'll probably hear us refer to. And we tried to color code the slides as well. So a lot of the gold elements or this orange color has to do with mandatory requirements. And these are the requirements that are applicable to all project types. And sometimes it's very general and it's in the first part of the code and other times they're gonna be mandatory measures that are specific to multifamily. Then there's the prescriptive component package that's coded in blue. And these um, requirements follow what's called a prescriptive package. 
And it's essentially a checklist approach, or sometimes I like to think of it as like a recipe card. You, you have to, to do the recipe correctly, you need to follow all the parts of the recipe or hit all the elements that are in the checkbox approach. And if you do that and document, um, document through that through your Title 24 forms, you'll have a code compliant building. Or you can do the performance method, which is essentially computer model. And it's the um, also called an energy modeling approach. And the energy modeling approach uses those prescriptive features as the baseline. So you can trade off things in the um, prescriptive approach. Like you could have a more efficient heating and cooling system, which could offset some envelope feature that wasn't quite meeting the prescriptive approach. But overall, your building's compared to a baseline building. And if you comply, you, you meet that. Now, under that performance approach, we have in California a metric that we've called TDV, time dependent valuation. And that's the way for a long time we've been looking at um, how much energy our building uses, but also how much energy goes into procuring the electricity or the fuel source that came to the building. So it's all put together and a lot of it, it really is based on the time of day that the energy is used, has a big impact. So what's new for 2022 is taking a look at not just those impacts um, relative to time of day and cost, but actually what kind of impact does our energy production have in terms of carbon emissions? And so now we've got this new source energy carbon metric. And again, for those who are more uh, kind of visual thinkers, we have TDV energy also took into account uh, wind production, solar production, gas fueled peaker plants, everything that goes into making the energy and what time of day the energy is created, plus the energy your building uses. And we'd look at that for efficiency and um, a total TDB. And the total includes your solar battery, other things. And then we have the source energy. And the source energy, yes, also includes how it's produced and what's used at the site, but it's specifically tracking carbon emissions associated with that type of energy production. So excerpt from a Title 24 report. This is, happens to be a low rise res report. And now we have these three metrics. So if your TDV efficiency score shows a pass, you're good. Then the total TDV, which includes in this batteries and solar contribution, pass, and then that source metric. If that also is a positive number, when we look at those three, you pass. All three together have to say pass, and then you have a passing project for the performance method. Okay, I'm going to move on to now some of the mandatory measures that are really just specific to multifamily, but I'm going to hit on a couple other things that are significant in some of those other categories that affect multifamily. Because um, this section is new for multifamily, I thought it would be useful to give you an outline of the topics that are covered under the new multifamily section 160. So it's going to go through your building envelope, ventilation, indoor air quality, condition. Uh, space conditioning systems, water heating systems, lighting, indoor, outdoor, et cetera, electric power distribution, covered processes, solar ready and electric ready. Now, a couple of these may sound like they are specific also to the non-residential uh, standards, and they are, and that's because a lot of these projects uh, can be mixed use. And I'm going to give you a bit of an example here of that sort of combination of low rise and high rise and kind of mixed use. 
starting off with one of the mandatory measures we're going to talk a little bit about, which is ventilation and indoor air quality. We're, um, we're picking this uh, indoor air quality topic because there's been a lot of uh, change in the low rise residential portion of it. And some of that is also impacting the high rise residential portion. Part A, kind of the general requirements is just really, it just spells out that the dwelling units are gonna end up following basically the residential code. They parallel it very, very closely. And then HERS field verification and diagnostic testing is gonna still be required for three habitable stories or less. And you're gonna be referred to the residential appendices for that. But even though multifamily is all combined together, we still have this big division between low rise and high rise. So low rise being three habitable stories or less, high rise being four or more habitable stories. So now, um, we're going to have those dwelling units follow some of the aspects of the non-risk, or rather the non-dwelling units are going to follow aspects of the non-residential code. And for some of those uh, projects that are four or more habitable stories, you may need HERS rating or you might need something called ATT, and that is um, an acceptance testing technician and um, Grant, you might, you might have something to say about this <laughs> if a question comes up on the acceptance testing technician part of it, but historically speaking, until pretty recently, we didn't have to worry about ATT. And now that's kind of come into play. So I think it was just, it's been, in October 22, or was it October 21? October 21, I think, is when, right around there, is when we had a critical number of acceptance test technicians and providers that could do this testing. And so now there's going to be special forms. And it's like a whole nother uh, kind of class that we taught on commissioning and acceptance testing that briefly touches on this. But I wanted to mention this because when you're doing projects that are multifamily, you are gonna have a plethora as a plans examiner, as a uh, you know, code enforcement official, there and is just folks who are working on these projects, there is a large number of forms that are associated with multifamily. And one of the big divisions here is, is it low rise or is it high rise? And part of that too, and then to complicate things just a little bit is mixed occupancy. And I, I point this out because for the most part, the code says that if you've got more than one type of occupancy, you know, like residential, non-residential, that you would um, look at each space type occupancy and meet the provisions applicable to that occupancy type. So you might have everything to do with the residential portion and then in a mixed use, you might have um, restaurant or maybe full service um, dining area and support spaces, or they could add a small retail store or offices there. So those two functions would be separate and you would typically have separate compliance documentation for these things. And then also it would depend on in the residential, is it high rise or low rise residential? So there is some exceptions to that and they're kind of nicknamed like the 80% rule and the 20% rule. I mean, sorry, 80% rule and the 90% rule. And the reason I mention it is if, you're, uh, if you receive documents that use this, these rules, then you're gonna see a combination of some aspects of the project being shown to comply with the major occupancy type. 
And then you'll see documentation separately that deals with lighting or some of the other uh, measures that are required to be documented separately. I, we're gonna talk about the highlights, but really all the forms that go for multifamily should be a whole nother course in and of itself. <laughs> I don't know what else to say there. I'm, I'm very sorry <laughs> if you're not familiar with all the forms yet. <laughs> Uh, just to give you a little bit of an idea, um, this is one of the resources that Energy Code ACE has put together. And by the way, Energy Code ACE website is where you can go to get a hold of a lot of the forms that will be used for the multifamily projects. And one of the big things to kind of notice is what the difference between say an NR or an NRCC series of forms versus the LM or the LMCC series of forms. And really this is where the NR is, stands for non-residential, but in this case, it's gonna include our high-rise multifamily projects, okay? And the LM is gonna refer to um, the low-rise, multifamily projects. But then beyond that, you're going to have certain types of certifications that go with it, whether it's just you're showing compliance or it's something that's been installed or it requires acceptance testing or just verification. Um, and then this part of that title and the form is going to give you an idea of really who's supposed to be taking care of it. Is it the enforcement agency? Is it a HERS rater that does it, a field technician, or, ex or an acceptance test technician? And that's that ATT portion. And really, I think the trickiest part kind of comes into play now is some of the requirements, and we're not going to go into it on this one, but there are some requirements specific to um, our multifamily projects that will require acceptance test technician. And the way the forms are set up and the way the code is set up is there are instances where your a builder could use the ATT instead of hers. And in other cases, um, some of the forms will say you can use hers or at and or even on high rise, it'll say you have to use hers. So kind of the devil's in the detail on that. Um, that's pretty much all I'm gonna say about this for now, cause it, <clears throat> it's very detailed. And I'll give a couple examples of some of the forms as we go along, but I'm mostly gonna shift gears and get back to like the big code uh, changes from 2019 to 2022. Jennifer, the one yeah. item I wanted just to clarify is that yeah. the CC, the compliance document, that is the design side submitted for plans examiners with the construction document set. Within that, that we all you know uh, refer to as the Title 24, right? Yes, um, yes. Within that document, it will tell you for the specific project which NRCIs, NRCAs, and NRCVs are required for the project. And all three of those additional form types are done in the field throughout construction and up to occupancy. So there is a break right there between those four different compliance types. Right. And then that same similar stuff is really kind of the LM forms follow how the CF1Rs we used, were used, used to using for residential projects where you get that CF1R compliance form and it tells you all the HERS tests you need and it just spells it out. So that part of the form looks pretty similar but you'll also see some categories for some of the mixed use occupancies. And if people are interested in that stuff, please reach out to the Code Coach service. We just presented on acceptance testing and commissioning and went through a lot of what those forms look like, who's, who's uh, applicable to do them, whose responsibility, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We're not gonna hit that today.
So anyway, back to the fun stuff. Now we're going to whiz through all these code changes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, really quick indoor air quality, there's been some changes on the whole indoor air quality ventilation requirements. But the main takeaway is that ASHRAE 62 continues to be the basis for the dwelling unit residential occupancies. And ASHRAE 62.1 continues to be the basis for the common space or the non-residential occupancies. But then within the dwelling units themselves, there's just been some clarification on uh, fan integrated ventilation systems. There's some new requirements for the kitchen exhaust. Um, there's some prescriptive ventilation ducting, duct sizing that goes with that um, kitchen exhaust. And there's some new sections that have to do with balanced ventilation and heat recovery and some new requirements for the testing of the ventilation airflow. For the fan integrated uh, ventilation systems, there's really new language to clarify kind of how and when um, those systems can be operated. And kind of, the, I think a main takeaway is to realize that continuous, and that's the key word here, continuous nonstop fan operation of a system like this is still not a permissible way of meeting your indoor air quality ventilation, but you can um, have damper controls, intermittent fans running, and um, as long as you can have variable ventilation and follow these other measures, you can, you can use your central system. There is a way to. Uh, Kind of a big change, uh, well, clarification really is that for the mechanical exhaust for kitchens and bathrooms, there's just like a finer level of detail now on what the controls need to be if it's an open kitchen or if it's an enclosed kitchen. And there is some clarification now that um, ERVs and HRVs can be used in combination with other uh, types of local exhaust for your bathrooms. And kind of a main premise is still, uh, is still there that if you have that intermittent or continuous ventilation fan as the way to introduce your indoor fresh air, indoor air, that still has to be labeled that the fan should be left on, except that it can be turned off when the outdoor air is very poor. And with multifamily, you can let the tenants control that. They need to be able to always uh, turn it on the local exhaust or boost it, but they don't necessarily have to have control over the whole system. That's the only difference between that and single family. For the kitchen range hood, there's a new metric for measuring kitchen range hood efficiency. It's called capture efficiency. I just spent a bunch of time looking up some hoods that are over our ranges or cooktops to see if I could find some that really had the capture or CE, capture efficiency rating. Not all the companies are doing it yet. Mostly the ones that have really high scores are the ones who are bothering with the test. So short of that, what you would do now um, with the new code is really take a look at the situation of your kitchen. You have to determine whether it's a natural gas range or an electric range. And in this illustration, if you had a capture efficiency of 55%, for example, that, that particular hood um, over a uh, electric range would be appropriate for an apartment that is sized between 750 or 1,000 square feet or larger. But for example, you wouldn't be able to do it in a smaller apartment or a studio apartment less than 750 square feet. You would have to either go up in your CFM rating or uh, have a higher capture efficiency. And then for gas stoves, the 
the efficiency has to be much higher and the uh, CFM that it pulls has to be much higher. And that's from a lot of testing that was done on indoor air quality. That uh, fluid and your uh, exhaust has to now be tested. And the idea is that your installer would field test it using the specialized equipment and document that and there is a table under the prescriptive, um, it's mandatory, but there's a prescriptive way you can also size your duct system that wouldn't require the testing. But both way, it's mandatory. And so what that means, for example, for a, in the low rise example is there's gonna be that LM, but the CI, MEC, 32H for hers verification that would be put in place and they your hers rater would come out and choose you know clarify how that uh, kitchen exhaust was met and they would use this form for calculating that um, in general for the kitchen and the same form could be used for the bathrooms. Uh, for the high-rise example, it's an, called an NRCV. So for verification, it also is to be completed by the HERS registry. And this form specifically is only addressing what you would need for kitchen and talks uh, specifically if you're using that kitchen hood as a continuous exhaust system. So that just gives you a little bit of an idea that for the specific characteristic, you'll need to know, okay, or, you know, basically if you're dealing with the high rise or dealing with low rise, that'll determine the forms. And like Grant said, they're gonna be on your, um, you're on your performance forms if you're doing it performance method, we'll tell you. For lighting, there's really, a, been only minor updates and probably kind of the main change is just that with indoor lighting, you're going to deal with dwelling unit lighting with tracks really closely with um, uh, single family indoor lighting. And then you're going to have like all the common service area lighting and any uh, lighting that is non-residential. And then that part of the lighting tracks very closely to the um, non-residential standards. And so minor updates where they're trying to make the language more uh, matching with the electric code itself and uh, changes in the multifamily that basically is just repeating and being more in alignment with what we have in the non-residential portion of the standards. Now, I do mention uh, this form here for the low rise, just because now this temporarily is as form fillable and it's, it's good until December 31st, 2023. This one you can get directly from uh, the CEC website but I call it the new everything form because this whole form is like 46 pages and it hits everything, including the non-common areas, commercial areas, even the parking garage areas. And it works for prescriptive and mandatory, but also for new construction and the whole section for alterations. So yeah, where, so as a plans examiner, I think that's kind of uh, uh, helpful to know that for low rise multifamily, you get it. It's all going to be showing up on the uh, the new everything form electric is what I call it, not broken into a lot of different ones. Uh, with the electric power distribution systems, there hasn't really been a big change here, except that you never really had to deal with electric power distribution when you were looking at the residential standards in the previous code, but now under 2022, it's addressed because it's assumed that you're gonna have a lot of non-residential occupancy and the, um, all the common spaces. And then again, those the forms you 
will totally depend on whether it's high rise or not high rise. And this still is basically about um, making sure that the power system doesn't have very much voltage drop and that it works for everybody and everything. Now, the section in the code dealings with electric ready. And I've combined it with the water heating because we did have a water heating electric ready requirements. And now we've got these additional electric ready requirements that are specific to furnaces, gas cooktops, gas dryers in the dwelling units and gas dryers in common space. And what this basically says is that, um, or what the California Energy Commission has figured out is that it's cost effective, it's most cost effective if the infrastructure for future heat pump water heaters and heat pump um, space heating systems and electric or induction cooktops and heat pump or condensing dryers or electric dryers are all installed now. The infrastructure is there and it's ready to make it easier for all these appliances to be traded off. And it, for each one of these things, it kind of spells out what size circuit you need and that they all have they need to be within a certain distance of the installed gas appliance. So the code doesn't say you can't install gas. It just says if you do install gas, for example, like this um, hot water distribution excerpt, it just basically says if you do install gas, you have to meet these other requirements that would make it easy for someone else to install a heat pump water heater. And that same kind of thing is true for the induction cooktop and for um, a heat pump, uh, if you install a furnace for space conditioning. And then I just pulled a couple excerpts here on the dryers, just to give you idea that it hits both on dryers if you put them in individual dwelling units or the dryers if you're just gonna do a commercial dryer system. Jennifer, what about ovens? Yeah. Ovens, it's, um, well, it's mostly uh, cooktops and range. So I, I don't know, in the multifamily, I haven't seen them split that out as here's your cooktop and here's your oven and then mixing the fuel separately. So I don't know, I, I don't even, I can't even think of any multifamily projects that installed gas ovens? Good question. We'll see if yeah. we something. <laughs> that one we might have to look up and just see in the fine print if it also says ranges because ranges have ovens or if it's right. just strictly the cooktop. Good. Good question. Okay. Under, um, under our new construction, prescriptive and performance because our prescriptive is the baseline performance. We're gonna go over some of the kind of the highlight changes. And there's a whole new section for this also, section 170. And how it's kind of broken out this in this section, it's similar to following the pattern you would see in the old code for, the, for all low rise residential in that we're gonna have um, the first part of that section deal with the performance approach. And then the second part of the section in 170.2 deal with the prescriptive approach. And we're gonna go through some of these features on the prescriptive approach because that's what is used as the baseline in your performance modeling. And then this section too, also in the beginning with the general scope, it just clarifies that those non-residential occupancies in a mixed occupancy building needs, needs to comply with the non-residential code sections that are applicable. 
that we're, uh, so there's a section here on the building envelope, um, daylighting for large and closed spaces, which follows the not really closely with the non risk standards, uh, space conditioning systems, water heating systems, lighting for indoor, outdoor signs. And then photovoltaics is really, it's split into what's required for three stories or less or photovoltaics required for four stories or more. And then battery storage systems, which actually only applies to the four stories or more. So um, because this there's this combination now of the low rise, the high rise and multifamily being a little bit different than single family, now it's in this new section. And so even though there's really been few changes, it's more like um, seeing it just all together is kind of new in and of itself and these prescriptive tables for our um, envelope requirements. And that also includes our um, windows or fenestration. And so there's some outlines now for explicitly defining um, your options. If you have an attic with ducts in the attic, or if you have an attic, but ducts are in the condition space, or if you have non-attic roofs, which seem to be really common for um, the non-residential spaces anyway. So just kind of give you a quick look at the new part is they're including like metal buildings, roofs in now the multifamily uh, section. So under your option D, it's like a cathedral ceiling, whereas before you'd be looking non-res standards and residential. Now it's combined here in the multifamily section with their new tables. And same with the walls, um, not a lot of changes for what you would think of from the low rise residential, a lot of wood frame walls, but what's new is now they're kind of pulling in these other framing types that you would just see multifamily in general. So we've got uh, metal building types or framed assemblies with greater than one hour fire rating and heavy mass walls uh, also included. QII, it's still a low rise requirement. So three habitable stories or less and climate zones one through six and eight through 16 and climate zone seven is exempt. So there's essentially um, hardly any change. It's, but it's just to clarify that QII still doesn't apply to the high rise, four stories or more. With the fenestration with the windows, this part looks quite a bit different because under the old code, your windows for the non-residential or high rise would be broken out into like the window type. And now we're looking at it across like all the climate zones. And then we can enter the table based on what type of window it is like curtain wall, for example. And then we're going to be breaking that down into um, whether or not we're talking about a building that's four stories or more or four stories or less. And then you would enter that table through all of those things together by climate zone to determine what you're supposed to do for your baseline for your windows. And each of those window types, you know, together, they still have a um, fenestration area allowance based on the window and floor areas. Exterior doors, same kind of thing. It's a new table because now we're looking at um, whether it's a dwelling unit door or a common use area door. And then those values are dependent on the climate zone. And so it's just more differentiation, but it's all in one big section so you can see it all together and not flipping back and forth. Um, with space conditioning, kind of 
alluding to those changes with the heat pump being the baseline. So again, it's broken into, are we talking low rise or high rise, three stories or less, four stories or more, and it's climate zone specific. So most of the climate zones will have a heat pump as the space conditioning system. And then just climate zone 16 um, can be a furnace with the air conditioner. And then for the four stories or more, almost all the climate zones will have a heat pump associated with it. But climate zone one and 16 can be a dual fuel heat pump system, which um, means it can include that gas and it can switch off and have uh, the heat pump function kick in when the weather is uh, cooperating. And there's no space uh, conditioning requirements for the common areas. This is just the change for the dwelling units. Um, ERVs and HRVs, it's an energy uh, recovery ventilation system and a heat recovery ventilation system. There are new tables for the mechanical systems. It has a lot to do with like fan efficiency or I mean, yeah, fan efficacy and recovery efficiency. And it, again, it's based on whether you're three stories or less and depending on your climate zone or four stories or more and dependent on the climate zone that you can use these systems or you have to use these systems rather in the prescriptive approach if you're in these climate zones this is what you would use as a way to introduce fresh outside air. Under the performance method, you could potentially trade these off. But the idea is to just start to have more energy efficient ways of introducing fresh outside air into our dwelling units. And for those of you who are not familiar with how that these types of systems work, is basically, um, in this case, this system here has these specialized filters that allow incoming air through one stream, um, outside air coming in through another stream. So you're taking air out of your house or you're taking air from outside and the air itself does not commingle, but it passes through these thin membraned, um, uh, they look like filters or not really filtering, but pass through these thin membraned um, channelized components and they can transfer the heat or transfer the cool from one stream to the next. So it tempers the incoming air and saves a lot of energy. Um, quick yeah. item on the HRV stuff. I yeah. just wrote a blog. I don't know if it's yet on the site, but it'll probably come out on the newsletter for the code coach corner um, yeah. about HRVs and um, the single family, what to look for on your tile 24, what inputs are required, where to find those inputs, what that means in, in the infield installation of, of what unit is specified or not. Uh, check it out if you're interested in learning more. Oh yeah, that's great. Okay, and then, um... Domestic hot water for the individual dwelling units. Really, there's that can change. You could still um, you could still install a gas appliance instantaneous water heater, but you've got to deal with the electric ready requirements, or you can have heat pumps. And depending on the climate zone, you might have to add a little bit more for the prescriptive um, approach to use a heat pump. For the central domestic hot water system, really, there's just been clarification for um, having clustered heat pump water heaters and also how to design for heat pump water heaters as being the central domestic system. And for um, centralized system, you could still use gas boilers or gang up um, on demand, uh, uh, you know, high efficiency condensing gas units, which we see pretty commonly used. What's 
maybe the biggest change is that they've just eliminated a requirement for two or more recirculation loops. So they're kind of leaving that part up to the best design by your mechanical engineer, or plumbing engineer. So not a big change, but they're just loop grouped together now. And same kind of thing here with the indoor lighting and controls. Um, it's grouped together. So the in dwelling units are still really closely matching single family, uh, common areas really matching um, and non-residential matching the non-residential standards. There's been some improvements on, or um, some call it restrictions, or you're required to be more energy efficient is what I'm saying with the lighting in the non-residential portions of your project. And so all those lighting power density tables have been updated. And it's basically because um, LED lighting is so commonly used and readily available. For outdoor lighting, not a whole lot of changes, but if you do deal with outdoor lighting, it's important to note that there is um, urban clusters now and urban classifications for what your lighting allowances are going to be for your hardscapes on these multifamily projects. And that's based on the 2010 census. So that makes it a little different than um, maybe what you've seen in the past. And um, there's a new method for calculating your lighting allowance for the hardscapes. For photovoltaics, um, there's been some clarification on what's called the solar access roof area, just so that's better understood and how you calculate it. But the bottom line here is that PV solar systems are required for multifamily projects. However, there's one formula that's used for three stories or less. And um, that formula is the same as we were using in our, in our single family um, requirements under the old code cycle. The one difference uh, that they've added is that if that PV system size turns out to be 1.8 kilowatts DC or smaller, it's not required that you do PV. So they have um, changed it to make the uh, requirement of PVs more cost effective. And this just gives you a table for the adjustment factors to use in that formula. You're gonna get a copy of the slide deck. So it's just to make it handy. So you can take a look at that and includes example. And then for your PV systems that are four stories or more, the formula is slightly different. There is a slightly different requirement on exceptions. So if the size is less than four kilowatts DC, and also you have to compare it to 14 watts per square foot times that SARA, times that solar area uh, roof access that we talked about in the previous slide. So two different requirements now for PVs and they each have their own section. This just gives you an idea of the adjustment factors. So in the formula, it's a completely different table. It's also based on climate zone, but it's also based on occupancy type. So if in the example in the previous slide, we're only looking at the high rise residential portion but in that project, there was also an area that had office and retail in the smaller building. So that portion of the project would have to be calculated using these other occupancies, and then it's all combined. And for four stories or more, battery storage is required if a PV system is required. And there's also some exemptions for the battery storage, but this is brand new requirement and it has its own section. For additions and alterations, I'm gonna hit on just a few of the highlights and it's mostly just to alert you 
that there's some new sections and it is pretty nuanced. So if you are working on additions and alterations, you're gonna need to go into that part of the code and really just take a look at what's required. And this part of the code is broken into uh, general requirements. Then the first part is additions for prescriptive and performance. Second part, alterations, which includes mandatory prescriptive and performance. Then if you're doing repairs, and also if you're working on the whole building. Um, a lot of this tracks with the mandatory measures that we just uh, talked about, but in some cases, the changes are a little more minor and they kind of gotten an upgrade, for example, like um, additions for the roof and ceiling. It climate zones two, four, eight, nine, and 10 got upgraded to requiring an R38 ceiling instead of the R30, for example. And um, there's a new section that's dealing specifically with altered ceilings and in climate zones one through four, six, eight through 16, that new uh, requirement for the ceiling insulation got bumped up to R49, so quite a bit higher. So it definitely is worth taking a look at um, these specific sections if that's what your project entails. And um, some clarification on what's required when you do these alterations and what to do with existing light fixtures or new light fixtures. So continuing with the new section, there's new requirements for air sealing also and um, making your whole uh, ceiling lid more airtight. Duct alterations. Uh, basically, they've gotten an upgrade and it just does some of the um, climate zones require uh, more insulation around the ducts. So R6, a lot of them now require R8. What probably the biggest thing to remember is that if your ducts are being um, extended, there's a new trigger of 25 feet, which used to previously be 40 feet. And then there's new duct leakage to um, testing to the interior and duct leakage to the exterior. And those are also more restrictive. So um, it's important to take a look at these, these upgrades. And then lastly, indoor air quality ventilation, kind of to follow up on the, some of those new sections, is they are clarify for additions that um, of a thousand square feet or less, or what's called a junior ADU. You don't have to do this, um, do the mechanical indoor air ventilation, whole building ventilation. But if you have, you know, additions greater than thousand square feet, yes, that triggers. And to also clarify that you need to follow the mandatory measures for the kitchen and bathroom exhaust. And then for alterations, the indoor air quality ventilation is just a brand new section. And it basically follows along with a lot of those mandatory measures that we discussed in the very beginning of the presentation with the kitchen exhaust, bathroom exhaust, and other requirements that would be applicable to whether you have a HERS rater come out or the um, acceptance test technician. And there's also clarification on what's considered to be a complete replacement of your duct system. And if that also, if you're doing a complete replacement and alteration, then that also is going to trigger uh, these new requirements. And with that, I know it's kind of a whirlwind, but we do have a code coach service. And Grant is one of our code coaches. And you can get to that code coach through the 3C REN website and click on Energy Code Coach. I'm going to hand this back over 
to Gray to talk about some upcoming courses. And we will stay on the line um, for those who'd like if you have some additional questions. Otherwise, we are wrap, pretty much wrapped up. Great, thank you so much, Jennifer and Grant. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, it is three o'clock, so in closing, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me directly, but I'll be sending out these slides uh, as well as a recording of this course to everyone who attended. We do still have three more courses in the ICC series, so catch us on the 28th. We'll be talking all about ADUs. Uh, and then we have some other great upcoming courses, including on June 22nd at the Slow Guild Hall, we will have an all-electric ADU available for anyone to come and learn more about um, ADUs and all-electric appliances. We also have our Q3 event calendar on the website now, so please check that out at 3c-ren.org. Great. Thank you all so much. Have a great rest of your day. Do you have any other